This, and welcome to Manchester, it is a gloriously sunny day. You are in the light, I am in the dark. Um, that's probably very appropriate. Um, this is, as you know, a workshop on theories of political ecology this week. So I've been given some thought to how one might approach a workshop on theories of political ecology. Um, my task for today is to focus on uh, the political ecologies of extraction. And what I want to do is to introduce a range of ways of thinking about extraction. I'm going to mention some theorists as we go along, but this isn't a kind of guided tour to theorists. Instead, it's a, it's a, a, a working through of how we might conceptualise what is a political ecology of extraction. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. And of course, as many people will be well aware, extraction covers a wide variety of commodities, from fish through water, fruits, resins, fibres, edible birds' nests, medicinal plants, and a whole uh, range of energy resources and raw materials. I'm going to pick up a number of those different commodities as we go along, but most of what I will say will be inflected through my own research interests which, as Maria has indicated, have been around um, hard rock mining and the energy minerals of oil and gas. So, I think it's fair to say that we are living in what one, one might describe as an extractive moment. Part of the cumulative but episodic material intensification of the economy. Pulses, if you like, over time in social metabolism. This particular moment is associated with a new round of geographically uneven development. So for example, while demand for many minerals has flatlined in the OECD economies, there's a new geography of demand, global shifts in demand, associated with shifts in the centre of gravity of the world economy, the rise of China, for example, but more broadly than that. Um, the emergence of industrializing powers outside the traditional core is creating new shifts in the geographies of demand and at the same time driving new frontiers of extraction. So as many people will be well aware, this is a historical tendency here towards this cumulative but episodic pulse-like intensification of the world economy. And we're living in one particular example of those, those moments. Along with that, then, are a, a range of classic minerals that are the driving forces of this extractive moment. One thinks, for example, of coal. Coal production is at an all-time high. Uh, China produces and consumes, China consumes more coal than the rest of the countries in the world economy put together at the moment. And that, of course, is driving landscape transformations in India, in Indonesia, and a number of other countries to provision the Chinese economy with coal. One thinks, too, of iron ore and a range of materials like oil and copper, the classic minerals. But, of course, there's another set of new frontiers coming into being associated with new material demands. Those associated particularly with electrification, the rare earths, for example, which find their role in everything from handheld electronic gadgets to wind turbines. So behind the new economies of electrification um, are uh, a range of raw material demands. One thinks, too, of changes in the food systems, uh, the rise of palm oil economies, for example, and biomass crops uh, for um, energy use. So we have some classic minerals and some new materials. And, of course, extractives have been a central question for political ecology. From the classic literatures, uh, one thinks, for example, of Eric Wolf's discussion of the fur trade in uh, The People Without a History or Eduardo Galeno's Open Veins of Latin America on Latin American extractivism, or people like Stephen Bunker writing in the Amazon, on the Amazon in the 1980s, Nancy Peluso's work on the political ecology of forest extractivism in East Kalimantan in Indonesia, for example, or indeed people like Tony Bebbington today, um, working extensively in Latin America, his recent piece in Geoforum, the journal called Underground Political Ecologies, thinking through the range of social activist movements um, that are involved in contesting, modifying, resisting extractive developments. So extractivism then is far from dead, it's far from a dusty relic of history, 
and underpinned a number of key contemporary questions, ones that are at the heart of um, entitled brand resource conflicts, the role of activist movements, questions of social justice and democracy, questions of waste. I've talked to uh, a number of mining engineers through the course of research and they, they very clearly describe mining as actually a business of waste disposal. That's the principal technical and physical challenge one faces in mining is how to deal with a load of waste material compared to a much smaller proportion <laughs> of commercially valuable material. That's certainly the case for hard rock mining, less so of course for coal. And underpinning that, of course, are questions about geographically uneven development. So just to round that, that point out a little more, you can think of the literatures in political ecology that have looked at the historic evolution of extractive cycles in Amazonia, in Indonesia. One might say the same, too, about Canada. And, of course, there have been some very specific policy regimes built up around extraction. Concerns around the resource curse in hard rock mining, for example, Concerns about how to make extractive reserves sustainable around uh, forest resources, for example. So in many ways, then, extractivism is central to the political ecology project. So the question then for me, what I want to try and explore with you today, is in what ways is extractivism a distinctive mode of production? We might be comfortable with extractivism or extraction as a descriptive term, as something to do with the physical removal of stuff, displacement of stuff, pulling it from the earth, most obviously. But what analytical weight should extraction carry? How does, how should a political ecology theorise extraction? That's the question I'm going to try and introduce today. So the question, of course, is where should one start? Classically, we might start here. If we're dealing with oil, the hole in the ground from which raw material is brought to the surface. So on the left, we have the spindle top gusher from Beaumont, Texas in 1901, which literally ushered in the age of plenty for conventional oil resources. It became the model for the development of gigantic um, oil deposits, it became the conventional form of oil for much of the 20th century. So the classic place to begin is with the hole in the ground. Today those holes look much more like this. Um, this is the uh, Thunder Horse rig um, in the Gulf of Mexico owned by BP. Uh, pulls to the surface around a quarter of a million barrels of oil per day uh, from around 5,000 feet um, below the surface um, of the ocean. So, in many ways then, this is the, the classic place where one might begin. And of course I'm going to come back to these places in a minute. But I think there's a problem if we think of extraction as something like this. And so I want to suggest an alternative. An alternative would be that we start here. But this is extraction. Okay. So what I've got in my hand here is really quite a remarkable object. Um, when you think about it, it's plastic on the outside, and it contains within it a litre of motor oil. And of course, the link between those is they've got the same raw material. So this speaks to the ingenuity of industrial capitalism. It can make a liquid, flam flammable liquid, and a durable solid out of the same material and package the two things together. And this rather neatly illustrates the two ways in which oil is principally used in conventional economies as both a feedstock for making a whole suite of plastics and as a fuel or a lubricant. So the liquid in the bottle is thicker than blood, it's more fluid than water, it's a combination of a range of carbon and hydrogen molecules. Chemically, it's mainly carbon, like us, and that's no coincidence, because it's made from the rendered bodies and proteins and carbohydrates laid down around 130 million years ago. And of course those have been reassembled through the process of extraction and refining to produce a particularly viscous form that we use for lubrication. And it's one of thousands of oil-based products that surrounds us in everyday life today. 
kind of oil products that build up a density in the urban environment that congregate, proliferate through urban economies. Part of the reason that I want to make that point is I think there's a danger if we think of extraction as occurring just through spaces of the whole where things come out of the ground, is it tends to displace extraction. It makes it a creature of somewhere that is not here but out there. So partly the mind shift involved in thinking about extraction as a range of commodity flows and the way that then those pool up in urban areas, for example, is to help us think about what the connections are between extraction and broader processes. So what I've tried to do with this little mind shift here is to raise the way that ex what the question of what is extraction is actually an epistemological question which is how should we understand or know this process? Where do we investigate it from? Through which sites, through which places do we set out to investigate extraction? By what methods can it be accessed and assessed? If we want to come up with an account of the social justice components of extraction, for example, where should we begin? So what I mean by an epistemological question is where do our methods place extraction geographically and socially? There's some interesting work taking place, and I think many of you may well be aware of this, and it's particularly through NGO organisations, which are coming up with novel cartographies of extraction to remap spaces of extractive activity. So on the left here, um, we have a... Uh, a mapping um, of the Western Hemisphere in this case by Carbon Tracker. Carbon Tracker is an organisation that reports on the investment risk associated with fossil fuels. And rather than map these extractive processes and the um, stocks of raw materials into national spaces where they reside geologically, what Carbon Tracker does is remaps those in on major world stock exchanges. So it's representing extractive, potential extractive activity, not in the spaces of geology, but in the spaces of financial risk, quite literally. To map onto the city of London what the holdings of oil, coal and gas are. And the point that they, the conclusion they come to, is that if one is to try and meet the two degree C rise um, which is t in, in temperature, which is largely regarded as the threshold for dangerous climate change, then a the significant proportion of those carbon stocks that are held by major companies are unburnable. In other words, the assets are massively overpriced, and therefore the investors are subject to a whole range of financial risk. So it's quite a neat little example of how to re-represent extractive activity, potential extractive activity, onto stock market exchanges in order to demonstrate, in this case, financial risk. On the right-hand side is another image by an NGO organisation called Platform. It's a London-based activist organisation. Uh, the image is not particularly clear, but it comes from an online podcast. You can download it. It's a walking tour, an operatic audio tour, is the way they describe it, music and verse, that basically walks you through the streets of London to represent extractive spaces elsewhere within the city. So it's making clear the connections between BP, for example, other major banks, and extractive activities that are funded beyond the city. So it's remapping extractive activity into the urban heartlands. So there's a number of activities taking place around the representation of extractive activity that are quite significant, I think, in terms of, because they raise questions about how should we approach this process. Okay. What I want to do now then is to go, go back to the more classic spaces, because that has been a good part, a substantial part of the literature on political ecology. And what I want to do here is to um, basically lay out where I'm going to try and go over the next 25 minutes or so. This diagram was my effort to try and think through where extraction is placed, what distinctions are made in the literature when people talk about extraction. <clears throat> so at a first basic level here, 
we've got sort of primary level activities. Remember your introductory economic geography, primary, secondary, and tertiary level activities in the economy. Primary level, nature facing taking of raw materials. <coughs> so we have extraction and agriculture on this level. And a good part of the literature makes a distinction. It says that these activities are quite different to those, to industrial production. There's a tension between these two things. They don't operate in the same way. And that that's the justification for treating extraction as a separate case. A second distinction is within this level between people who say, well, there's extraction and then there's agriculture. And these are two different logics. And I'll come on and explain a bit about that in a minute. That sure, they're primary sector, sure, they're nature facing, but in terms of what they do to generate productivity, they operate in very different ways. That's the assertion that's made. And then, once, the, so those are two primary distinctions. And then within that, we have a number of people who say, yes, extraction is distinctive, but it's distinctive in, for different reasons. Some people make the point that extraction is distinctive because it leads to particular forms of unequal exchange. So it's using the argument that, that extraction is distinctive because of the trade relations that are built through extractive activity. A much more substantial in terms of volumetric, not necessarily in terms of its arguments, but amount of stuff that's written, is about extraction as a productive process, about the marshalling together of the forces and relations of production, and that somehow there's something distinctive in extraction. And then there's a smaller but I think significant body of literature around extraction as driven by a speculative logic. So what I'm trying to do here is to demonstrate how there are really three different cuts within the literature on extraction, around exchange, production and speculation. And that, this is the fourth level in here, these in different ways say that what makes extraction distinctive has to do with the material properties of the stuff that one is dealing with that the biophysical characteristics of extractive industries dealing with populations like the beaver roaming around in the hinterland which must be captured, brought together and then shipped in its skin form into Europe for example or hunting whales or hunting fish or the fluid character of gas or the refractory character of a lot of gold ores it just simply won't break away from the sulphides in order to get the gold so there's something to do with the material properties that make a difference. And typically that comes down to the idea of time, space, and form. So I'm going to say something about that as we go along. And because I don't expect everybody to be fascinated by extraction, so here's the conclusion. So if you want to doze off, here's the conclusion. The conclusion is that extraction then is a mode of production, by which I mean a combination of productive forces, relations of production, and what we might describe as the conditions of production, the environmental conditions, that is based on the capture or appropriation of an ecological subsidy, an ecological surplus. What I mean by that is it's a taking, an appropriation of time and space. So the clearest way of thinking about this is, um, at least in my head, because it's the material that I work on, is, is oil, that the tapping of these subterranean oil reserves is liberating material that has taken geological periods of time to produce, to condense in a highly ordered form of energy and materials. And liberating it on the surface has, is spatially transformative. The process of time-space compression that geographers spend a lot of time thinking about as a condition of modernity um, Aldous Huxley's phrase that speed is the only genuine modern experience. The liberation of this material is essentially a transfer of geological time mm -hmm. to annihilate space on the surface in the present moment. So you, um, a lot of interesting work by ecological economists, Alf Hornberg, for example, part of this network, and some fascinating work on the way that um, uh, material flows across space are a transfer of the productive potential of space from the periphery to the core. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So if, if extraction then is a, is a mode of production based on the capture of surplus, extraction under capitalism is based on the appropriation of surplus for purposes of accumulation. 
It's not just done to perpetuate livelihoods, it's done for the purposes of accumulation. And the classic way of thinking about that is the idea of commodities produced for exchange. My own view is that that's a bit restrictive, and that actually we can think about extraction as an appropriation of surplus to enable accumulation as being about a whole suite of opportunities that extraction provides for circulating capital in all its forms, not just in the commodity form. I'm thinking here particularly about speculation. So that's my kind of little bit rider on it. I want a, a more elastic understanding of accumulation, not just about commodities, but about capital circulation in all its forms. And the third point will be that environmental conditions, time, space, and form strongly shape the institutions of extraction. All right, so that's where I'm going. I've had enough. You can feel free to go. So we ought to take a step back. So one of the popular ideas out there, which comes from classical political economy, is that natural resources, the stuff on which extraction is based, are gifts of nature. That's the handy phrase. So this bearded chap on the right is not one of the great classical economists. He is instead a prospector. A prospector with a nugget of gold in his hand. And if you like, this is the iconic idea of a gift of nature. You stroll out there one fine sunny morning and find yourself in the stream a nugget of gold. Nature just bequeathed you a gift. There it is. So what this language of gifts of nature really means, if we think it through a little bit, is that resources are preformed. They are anterior to human labour. They occur prior to human labour. In other words, they are the product of natural production. So the gold nugget is in place there through hydrothermal, geological processes that have nothing at all to do with human labour. So we think about biological resources like fish stocks, for example. The uh, fish uh, stock itself is the product of trophic regimes, of photosynthetic processes of the accumulation of biomass that pre-exists human labour. And what that means then is that labour inputs are limited to capture and removal. So, much later on, in the 20th century, Karl Polanyi, in The Great Transformation, would term these types of commodities as fictitious commodities because of the way that they are inputs to production that circulate in the market as if they're commodities produced exclusively for exchange, when in fact they're not. Their production occurs out of natural processes prior to human labour. And another language for thinking about this comes from um, work on the second contradiction of capitalism by people like James O'Connor um, and others that the conditions of natural production, the conditions of production for these materials are not capitalised. So the oil well, for example, it's not possible to intervene in those geological, this would be the argument, that it's not possible to reproduce those geological periods that assembled a highly concentrated oil resource. They're not capitalised. So what I want to do now then is to try and draw out this distinction between extraction and industrial production. And this, this distinction comes out most clearly in the work of Stephen Bunker in his book Under Developing the Amazon in the 1980s. And what he does is he creates a, um, a structural understanding of the world economy divided between productive economies, in, economies based on industrial production, and economies based on extraction. And he says these two things are linked, these two economies are linked. There is an absolute dependency, he says, of material production on resource extraction. So those industrial economies require raw material inputs, would be the short way of saying that. But the differences between the two logics, industrial production and extraction, produces an inequality in forms of exchange between these two types of economies. And probably the most interesting aspect of that work, I think, is his suggestion that time and space work differently in extraction and agriculture than they do in industrial production. 
And I'll come on and flesh that out a bit more when we deal with time, space, and form. So this work, of course, has been picked up and developed more elaborately through more recent work on extraction as an, an unequal form of ecological exchange. And the um, Environmental Justice, Liabilities and Trade, uh, Joanne martinez Allier's uh, project, EJOLT, FP7 project at the moment, is very much about this. It's about the processes of unequal ecological exchange through raw material transfer. So down at the bottom here is a, this is a, a sector that I work on at the moment, which is natural gas. And this is a shipment of liquefied natural gas. And the argument would be that these flows are predominantly uh, south-north flows of energy, natural resources, and one might also add industrial waste. <coughs> and using the methods of ecological economics, one can show how these are net transfer, transfers of um, energy and materials in um, energetic and weight terms. So that a highly ordered, low-entropy form of material is transferred from extractive regions, and the value of that, its ordering potential, is accrued by industrialising economies. What is left then in the periphery is a simplified, degraded set of materials, whilst the industrial core appropriates this highly ordered form, uh, which is then dispersed through a number of, sort of dissipative structures of urbanisation. The effect, of course, is a process of environmental cost shifting at the world scale, through the language of either ecological overdraft or ecological debt, uh, depending on who your lead author is. The sense here that these flows are structural flows linked, uh, structural flows of trade that produce inequality at the world scale, based on fundamentally different logics, industrial production, the transformation of raw materials, and extraction, the taking of a highly ordered form of materials and its displacement, its movement. So the second distinction is between then, if that was between industrial production and extraction and cultivation, loosely based around Bunker's work and then more recent work uh, in ecological economics, another distinction is between extraction and cultivation. Sure, these two things are nature facing and there's a handy phrase that um, the National Mining Association, the go-to organisation to champion mining in the US, likes to roll out this phrase, if it can't be grown, it has to be mined, as a justification for extraction. Um, so these two activities are seen as, as primary. Sure, they're both nature-facing, the argument goes. Um, and that the characteristic that links them is that there is an incomplete control in both of them over the materials and processes. That we're kind of playing with nature here, in the sense that we have incomplete control over processes that are involved in the production of all of these, geological processes for all reserve, biological processes for fish and crops, for example. And their point is that actually the logics of production are quite different. So a key piece here is by uh, William Boyd, Rachel Sherman, and Scott Prudham in the journal Society and Natural Resources in 2001, where they make the argument these are fundamentally different logics of production because, they argue, in extractive systems, one has no control over natural production. That's what they say. You essentially have to go take what natural production gives to you. Whereas cultivation, agriculture, labor is actually able to modify these natural processes. So if we think about plant breeding, there's an intervention in the productivity of a biological system for crop cultivation, where labor, the action of seed selection, for example, or irrigation, drainage, soil improvement. These are all processes of modifying the conditions under which this material is produced. So Ted Benton, environmental sociologist, writing in the 1990s, got somewhere close to this argument, where he made, made the point that labour is eco-regulatory. That was his way of describing this. That labour isn't transformative in agricultural systems in the way that it is in industrial ones where it works on and transforms raw materials. Instead, labour inputs are about modifying the conditions under which crops grow, is a clear example. So just to explain the pictures, one on the left, it's a little difficult to see. From back there, perhaps, is coal mining. 
that's the extractive logic, and on the right you have a, a field of wheat. Now behind this is a broader literature in agrarian political economy about the extent to which the biophysical conditions of agriculture and the labour relations associated with biophysical conditions limit the capitalisation of agriculture. So people like Susan Mann, for example, and what they're most interested in is what they refer to as the disjuncture, this incompatibility between production time and labour time. And this is really quite simple. Because if you've got to, if you're going growing a crop, you've got to put a seed in the ground and then sit back. And you've got to wait until that thing does its stuff and grows and produces the crop that you want. So labour inputs are limited in time, putting the seed in the ground, then a bit of weeding perhaps a bit of irrigation, but production time is that whole chunk of time between putting the seed in the ground and harvesting the crop. So there's a disjuncture between labour time and production time in cultivating systems that in, in this argument makes a difference. It makes a difference in industrial production and as Boyd um, and Prudham and Sherman would go on to say, it, makes a, it, it characterises cultivation as different from extraction. So let me try and explain that. So if Ted Benton's argument is that labour in agriculture is eco-regulatory, it tinkers around with the conditions of production, then these guys, Boyd et al., go a bit further. And they say, actually, cultivation, you can physically take hold of those biological processes to increase productivity. You can squeeze nature harder, if you like. So you're able to get in there, and crop breeding and animal husbandry is a great example of this, of course, genetic engineering is the ramping up of this process. They're actually able to take hold at the molecular level in genetic, genetic engineering <coughs> of the biological reproductive process in order to drive productivity. Whereas in extraction, they say, you can't do that. So their, their little handy quote here is that geological production is for all intents and purposes beyond the scope of human control. That, they argue, is the difference. And this might be um, unnecessary for today's purposes, but as it's a workshop on theories, here's another little tweak of theory, is that these authors go to Marx, and they use a distinction that Marx makes in terms of thinking about the historical evolution of productivity of labour. And they take that distinction, and they apply it to these nature-facing industries. That distinction is between the formal and the real, subsumption of labour or subsumption of nature. What they mean by that is that the formal subsumption is where one goes out and gets more labour or gets more raw material. So the formal subsumption of labour is where you extend the working day. You generate productivity by having people work longer. And the real subsumption is where you actually intervene in that work process through technological innovation, through changing the social relations of production, and you drive productivity that way. So this is their distinction that they use to say cultivation, agriculture, can do the real subsumption of nature. Extraction can't. All right. So. Now then, having said that, I don't quite agree with what they say. <laughs> because they're making a very hard distinction here that all extraction, all extraction can do is capital can, capital can only circulate around nature in extraction. And that there's no scope for getting in there and modifying the processes of natural production. And I don't think that's always the case. And here's a very visible example of this that's highly problematic for a range of reasons, politically, analytically, and it's to do with unconventional oil production. The tar sands in Alberta. There are other tar sands around the world. Here's the one that's been brought into industrial production quite dramatically over the last decade. And if one thinks about what's going on in tar sands production, the, the, the clue is right there on the name of the bit of equipment. The bit of equipment is called the industrial upgrader. What's occurring in the industrial upgrading process, these very large bits of equipment with steam pouring off them, is that the geological processes that produce liquid oil from hard rock that took 130 million years to produce for conventional oil, 
capital is substituting for that geological process. Investments in bits of a kit, bits of equipment, that will produce a liquid form from a solid material that is fed into it. And the technology involved there involves the application of energy and heat, and it also involves hydrogenation, adding hydrogen to the carbon molecules to make it less viscous so that it will flow. So my point here is then that this hard distinction that Boyd and others make between cultivation and extraction, I think is too much of a hard distinction. And some of the most interesting cases, analytically I think, are where extraction is behaving much more like cultivation, where there are innovations that are designed directly to squeeze this natural process, to substitute for the geological processes that we would normally think of as natural production. There's other examples. In biologically assisted mining, for example, the use of bacteria to break down ore bodies, where these bacteria are, uh, as far as I understand, they are not genetically modified yet, that's the next frontier, but their conditions of operation are certainly highly managed, temperature, acidity, water content, things like that. And it's use of biological processes to liberate minerals. Okay. Got to keep moving. All right. So <clears throat> what this literature does, that I've just laid out, Boyd and Bunker and others, uh, very nicely do, I think, is that they get into, you know, they take us to this confrontation in production with na nature, with the biophysical material. So we need some language for, well, you know, we know na nature's messy, that it exists in a whole range of forms, and in your projects, uh, you'll be grappling with really varied, heterogeneous assemblages of the non-human world. So we need some analytical framework for dissecting all this diversity. And Scott Pridlin, geographer at the University of Toronto, in his book Knock on Wood, which is about forestry, and the shift from old growth forestry to plantation forestry, comes up with a threefold distinction, form, space, and time. So this is the way that nature matters, if you like, in extractive production as form, as space, and as time. So just briefly on this, for form, what he's really got in mind here is things like the material differences in which raw materials present themselves. Solids and fluids, for example, two different modes of pre presenting energy, for example, but have very different characteristics in terms of how easily they can be commodified. Mineral ores, are they highly disseminated, diffused, or are they very concentrated? The value per unit weight. Uh, some interesting work done by people like Philippe Le Bion, a political geographer on extractive resources and conflict, where one of the material differences that he's interested in is the lootability, the lootability of particular minerals. And that has a lot to do, not entirely, but a lot to do with their value per unit weight. The heterogeneity, how diverse are they? So the point is that these, you know, we, might, we might idly sit here and think of the number of different ways in which our resources vary from one to another. But the point is these differences matter because it's around those that technologies circulate. Technologies have to grapple with those differences. In terms of space, um, we might think of uh, the way that the resources present themselves in space. If we're dealing with fish or whales, one of the characteristics of those is that they're fugitive species. They move around. Now, they don't move around randomly. They move around on particular patterns. There's a cyclicality often to them, but they move around. And that presents a problem to extraction. The roaming of particular fish species, that they occupy large spatial areas and don't show up in the same place all the time, is a problem for technologies of fishing. The same with the um, uneven nature of vein-like ore bodies underground. It's not guaranteed that where you drill you will hit the ore body. So the spatial characteristics of these resources are very important for understanding the way that they become involved in systems of production. The final point here is on time, um, and this again echoes the point around the distinction between cultivation and extraction. 
The simple point would be here that exhaustible resources. Um, the word exhaustible here is really a, uh, a judgment about the time horizon for renewal. But oil, oil is a renewable resource. It just takes you 130 million years to reproduce it. So in any, any meaningful sense, it's non-renewable. So the point is for a lot of extractive resources is that the processes of formation, massively in brackets, depending on what your resources, exceed those of industrial capital. So this question of time, quite an interesting way of thinking about the dimensions of extractive resources. All right, so what I'm, what I'm going to do now is I've kind of try to lay out some particular bodies of work and to link, it, to show how they might be linked, how they might be useful for thinking about extraction. I'm going to take a slightly different uh, uh, take now. And this draws on um, a book that's just come out that I uh, co wrote with Philippe Le Bion at, at the University of British Columbia, where we work through the oil production network. And our diagram here, which uh, we spent probably rather too long thinking about, um, was to work out in this production process from accessing the resource through refining and production and creation of value through the industrial process to the process of consumption, the distribution of revenue and the distribution of environmental impacts. My point here would be that a political ecology of this would want to work out how time, space and form were involved in each of these cuts. So for an extractive resource, we want to understand the way in which the characteristic of the resource, its time dimensions, its spatial dimensions, and its materiality, make a difference to the process of extraction. So let me try and, I'm not going to go, you'll be relieved to hear, I'm not going to go all the way through all those five stages, but I'm going to try and illustrate it with a couple of examples around access. So, Many of you will know um, from either previous experience or work you're starting to do now that in these extractive zones of the world economy, um, there is a cartography, a map making process that shows up very frequently, and it's the cartography of access rights, typically of claims. And so for mineral resources, territorially bounded mineral resources, these are produced as a mining cadastral map, the map of who has what land claims. So here's one, this is rather an old one. This is for northern Nigeria in 1912. It's around tin mining. And what it's showing is an access right, the mine claim, which is allocated to individuals over a particular surface. And so my point's really a simple one, that we could see these access cartographies as being structured in particular ways. And the structuring takes place through the biophysical characteristics of the material and the needs of circulatory capital, if you like. So it's the connection between these two things. So if we think about the form here, um, a lot of the minerals in this particular setting are are what's called placer minerals, they're disseminated, they occur in gravels. So the shape of these claims it has a certain um, uh, spatial dimension that reflects that placer character. But basically it's known that these placer min that, that it's known that these deposits contain a certain amount of material. So there's less, there's less risk associated with these placer mining. It's simply a matter of gathering up your gravels and sifting it out and producing the cassiterite, the type of ore. So that geological form produces a property right that has particular spatial dimensions to it. There's a time dimension to this too, which is the need to, need to ensure that capital will circulate through this landscape. So these mining rights are limited in terms of how long they can be held for. And there are particular work requirements on those. It's possible to interpret um, these sorts of landscapes, cartographies of mining access, as um, efforts to capture uh, resources. Uh, so they're very much like capture fisheries in that regard. It's the idea of capturing, laying a claim, an exclusive monopoly right, limited in time and space, to a particular concentration of ecological surplus, of ecologically rich resource. 
those access rights, then, we can link this to a theory of rent, which would be what's occurring through these rights is the ability to capture significant rents by, by uh, holding and excluding others from using those resources. So some very interesting work done on lowland banana plantations in the Caribbean, for example, of the way that large multinational firms bought up prime agricultural land but retired it from production. The idea was essentially to prevent competition from using those key bits of land. So what's going on here is a, an interaction between the physicality of the material itself and the circulatory demands of <laughs> capital. Let me move on here to talk a bit about um, production processes. How am I doing for time, Maria? Yeah? Oh, really? I, I shan't use it up talking. Um, <laughs> so it's really up to you. Okay. It's very okay. interesting. I, sh you I, can, can I shall on. move a little more quickly. Um, okay. So the point that I want to make now is to um, deal, deal with one of the characteristics of extractive resources, which is the fact that they are depleting assets. An exhaustible resource is depleted over time. Um, this is most clear, of course, for so-called non-renewable resources, but we can also think of a range of what in the resource literature are often called critical zone resources, essentially renewable systems that can be pushed too far, soil erosion, soil resource, fish populations, groundwater, can all be extracted in a way such that they're not renewable. We're all familiar with that. In other words, it's not limited to simply non-renewable resources. a particular characteristic because of these depleting assets that extractive economies are often marked by an initial boom. And this initial boom is one where there's a very uh, a, a low ratio of capital and labour relative to the value that's produced. That's the characteristic of the boom. A low ratio of labour and capital relative to the value of the material that's being produced. Over time there's an increase in labour, people migrate in, capital, bits, big bits of equipment get brought to bear on the resource challenge, the resource problem, and depletion sets in. So behind these extractive boom-bust scenarios is an interaction between labour and capital and the biophysical character of the raw material. It produces this distinctive boom-bust phase. So extraction is, deplete, um, extraction is, a de is an auto-consumptive process. So for people who follow neo-Marxian arguments about a second contradiction of capital, here's one of those contradictions. The production process today undermines the conditions for future accumulation. And this often gives not all extraction, but quite a bit of extraction, a rip and run character. You get in there, you cream off the high value, you capture that ecological subsidy, you get out of there, onto the next site. So the quality of the material typically will decline over time, I'll say a bit about that in a second, and that produces this technological treadmill character. So let me illustrate that. This, this um, diagram on the right, uh, sort of a standard diagram that one sees in, in work on um, uh, resource quality. This is called the resource pyramid. Uh, it's quite simply that towards the top, you've got a little bit of very high quality stuff, and towards the bottom, you got a lot of much lower quality material. So in the case of oil, we've got a relatively small amount of light, sweet, crude, the highest value component, and masses of amounts of tar sands. Yeah, so high value component, much ma larger mass of lower value material. So typically production will follow a process of moving down the resource pyramid. So in any one setting, extraction costs over time will rise, output will fall. And that, because of this depleting character, there are then available three strategies that firms can take in response. So the point about mentioning this is that if one wants to understand the nature of production in an extractive regime, or to understand the emergence of new resource frontiers, this framework is quite a useful way of thinking about which strategy is being utilized as a way of dealing with the depleting asset character of extractive resources. 
So the three strategies are basically innovation in place. Change the technical, socio-technical conditions, production. Innovation. Part of that, or slightly different to that, is a form of innovation, but you still do the same stuff, you just do it at a much bigger scale. So it's still innovation, but it's innovation of size rather than a qualitative difference. Scaling up. And the third strategy is spatial relocation. Go somewhere else. Let me just briefly spend a bit of time with those. So this, the first one of innovation and scaling up. Ben Fine, um, in a really interesting piece in, um, 19, wrote in 1994, describes sort of two logics, one of intensification, one of extensification. Quite handy. Again, these things work on until you start to squeeze them a little bit and you see that they're not as neat distinctions as one might imagine. Um, Jason Moore, um, formerly at Lund and now at Umea in Sweden, uh, has elaborated on this point, talking about not intensification but commodity deepening. The point is that in any one setting, depletion can be handled by, by scaling up the level of capitalization, by throwing capital at the problem. One example of that um, is increased economies of scale, And as economies of scale go up, bits of equipment, literally bits of equipment, get bigger and bigger. Big mining machines, enormous tr wheels, trucks, um, massively powered diesel uh, uh, trawler fleets for fisheries, for example. So the scaling up of this equipment creates new barriers to entry. So smaller players can't get into the game. So there's an organizational shift taking place here towards the concentration of capital reduction in the number of players, and growing debt, again, is an organizational component, is that increasingly the logics of these companies, because they're having to borrow large amounts of money, are conditioned by their borrowing processes. So there's an awful lot one can do with that. My point is here, it relates ultimately back to this depleting character extraction. A component of this is that along with these... Um, along with the intensification and increased scale economies of production, are what um, Stephen Bunker and Paul Sickentel in their book Globalization and the Race for Resources describe as increasing diseconomies of space. So if you scale up a plant to process iron ore, for example, that requires you to feed this plant. You need bigger mines to feed the bigger plant. If you build a big oil refinery, you've got to make sure, you've got to, you have to run these things uh, at full tilt to maximize um, uh, their financial return. That means you need to ensure a through flow into this plant of a sufficient volume of material. And you then have to handle the movement of that material across space. So there's a scaling up in production that leads to a scaling up in transportation. So this is the phenomenon of Railroad cars, tankers, uh, super tankers, ocean tankers, the equipment of transportation getting bigger over time as a way of handling the depleting character of the asset. There's something else that's interesting that occurs around this is that because you need larger and larger, so let me give you an example of Thunder Horse, the BP drilling rig I showed you at the beginning, a quarter of a million barrels of oil a day it can process, well that's fine if you've got a big enough oil deposit to supply a quarter of a billion, million, sorry, quarter of a million barrels of oil per day. But the Gulf of Mexico, increasingly, does not have those sorts of oil reserves. So what it means is that there are lots of oil reserves in the Gulf of Mexico, but they're all quite small, because the big ones have been utilised. So a, key, a, a chief engineering frontier is how do you make small deposits look like big ones, economically? How do you join them up? in such a way is that they work to provide this through flow, throughput of raw materials that these big bits of kit need. So I think, I mean, that, that strikes me as a really interesting dimension of the extractive challenge around the world at the moment, is making small bits of stuff look like big bits of stuff in order to get the economies of scale that one needs. <coughs> so of those various logics, innovation and scaling up was one, I kind of breezed through it there. Uh, the other one here would be extensification, going somewhere else. And this is the, um, the, the spatial logic of the commodity frontier, 
of locating somewhere else in order to tap, appropriate, and make a new boot, to appropriate a new ecological surplus somewhere else. So what we've got here is um, some work I did in Guyana um, of uh, mining claims around gold. Uh, the, the two illustrations, one's a graph, one's a map, they show the same thing, which is basically the extension of these mine claims um, in the 1990s across very large parts of the country. And these are efforts, if you like, that access cartography of tapping, acquiring, capturing the value um, of gold resources in place. And this process is rightly described, I think, as one of primitive accumulation. It is a process of taking um, raw materials, tapping this ecological surplus. And the point is, of course, um, through David Harvey's work and others, is that primitive accumulation is experienced as a process of dispossession. And the reason for that, in many of these extractive economies, is because the land and resources is already appropriated and embedded in other existing livelihood systems. So it's experienced as dispossession because of the way those the surface use, the water resources, are already embedded in, already appropriated. They're used in various ways. They might not be formally titled and exist on state registers of land ownership, but there will certainly be customary rules, received rules, around who has access rights to that material and how it can be used. So these processes then of extending the commodity frontier to uh, appropriate an ecological <coughs> surplus are experienced in many settings as a process of dispossession. Tony Bevington's work, I mentioned his, his work earlier on, nicely works through this to say that in many instances, so this, this map of Guyana suggests that all of Guyana, three quarters of Guyana, the top bit, the north bit, becomes gold mining. Well, it doesn't. A lot of that land does not get converted into gold mines. It's claimed for mining, but not used for mining. Tony Bevington's point is that, that whilst you don't get absolute dispossession, you get tremendous uncertainty introduced into these landscapes as a result of these claims. And that uncertainty itself is a form of dispossession. Um, my point here, I'm happy to talk about this later if anyone is interested, my point here was to demonstrate how the extensification and intensification have worked over time, over 200 years, to influence the price for raw materials. And we've got these classic curves where the price for copper in this instance falls over 200 years and production booms. The point here is that in many extractive industries, these are, we're dealing with fungible commodities. Commodities that are essentially the same when they're experienced in the marketplace and can be substituted one for another. And in these sectors, prices <coughs> typically follow costs. So as this competitive process works to bring costs down, so prices for these materials fall. And as prices for these materials fall, that's why they become then embedded in urban landscapes in the global north. So this logic then of dealing with depletion, of scaling up, of tapping new sources is the mechanism through which prices have fallen over time and that falling price over time is how these materials have become socially proliferated and become embedded in northern economies. Um, I was going to work this through through an example of fisheries. Um, I, I won't for that out of the interests of time. But what it does show is a similar quality, quality shift, a moving downgrade, in this case from one trophic level to another from top predators, the tuna, down towards mackerel to other uh, 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 smaller fisher, smaller fish, lower trophic levels that are typically further and further away from markets. So it's both a geographical shift, sometimes it's a vertical shift into the deeper ocean, but it's a movement down the trophic levels. And um, I forgot his name, David Pawley, uh, University of British Columbia, fisheries scientist, written extensively on this, the idea that we're now eating bait. What used to be bait, the thing we would use to catch other fish, is now our food. So we're moving down these trophic levels. So my final point that I want to come on to is to um, uh, pick, up, pick up the 
third of those circles that I talked about, exchange, production, and speculation. <coughs> The reason I want to do this is because in, in my own work and through talking with other people, one of the things that becomes apparent if one's thinking about extractive economies, if you're trying to understand what's occurring in a particular place as companies are stampeding, tripping over themselves to try and lay claim to ground, for example, or there's some sort of shadowy presence of a potential exploration geologist who's doing something in the hills and nobody really quite knows what's going on, is to try and understand, well, why is it that at any particular moment in time, Somebody is thinking about investing in extraction. What's the, invest what's the value proposition in investors' terms? Why would you sink your money in a hole in the ground, in my case, or in offshore fisheries, or in timber extraction? Why would you do that? And that is useful, I think, as a way of thinking about what ultimately drives these extractive booms is the availability of capital and the attraction of capital, given all the range of other things it could potentially invest in, the attraction of extractives as an outlet for surplus. So this is from some earlier work. I've, I've, I've talked about this um, in Barcelona, actually, uh, last year. Um, some work with uh, Thomas Fredrickson, a former grad student, currently works here in development studies, looking at mining booms associated with the raising of investment capital in London at the end of the 19th century. So what this simply shows is the number of companies that were floated on the London Stock Exchange for mining um, uh, from the period of time scale hasn't come out on here. But that's basically 1875 uh, through to about 1910. And what this shows is the various places in which that those firms were making their investments. And it shows a series of mineral booms driven primarily by gold, but there's some copper and some silver in there as well. And we could go to town and unpick that and talk about particular places where this money showed up. But my point is that, is to, is that we need to understand, I think, extraction as an, an outlet um, for capital <coughs> circulation, as an outlet for surplus capital. So that what we're interested in is extraction as one moment in a much bigger process of circulating capital. So... Um, this is a, another, another way one can sort of access this question of where does extraction sit. Sorry, the thread I had in my mind that I just lost for a minute is the idea of de what I said decentering extraction, the headline of the slide. So my point is to try and decenter the mind from our, we tend to get fixated on this space where physical removal is taking place. Instead, I think it's much more productive to think about the circuits of capital flow that show up in that one place and how they're linked to accumulation elsewhere. So one way of accessing that, if that sounds all very uh, distant, very abstract, is through things like this, which are share certificates. Share certificates and prospectuses um, for companies that are proposing a value proposition from extractive activity. They're essentially trying to raise money, the share certificate, to take surplus that's accumulated somewhere, in this case, the banks, and uh, well, in this case, it's individual private owners in the UK economy um, looking to sink their capital in a Nigerian mining venture in the 1910s. So it's surplus that's coming out of the UK economy in that period that is being transferred to northern Nigeria in this period and sunk into mines and projects acquiring land so that it can be recirculated. And um, this diagram is perhaps too complicated, um, but it, it's my uh, effort in the context of that work on, on Nigeria and capital export from the UK to think about the way in which the mine, the mine, the extractive part, sits here in Nigeria, is linked to whole flows of accumulation taking, to whole flows of circulation of capital taking place elsewhere. Let me try and explain it just briefly. Uh, happy to talk about it more later if one likes. Here we've got an industrial process in the UK producing surplus from the work manufacturing workshop of the world. You'll see a legacy of that in Manchester um, as you walk up and around through town. And what this does is produce surplus through an industrial process. Some of that money then gets um, uh, reinvested, primary circuit reinvested in the UK economy 
But in that period at the end of the 19th century, what's striking about it is a lot of it leaves, and it goes as capital export and shows up in places like the Whitwater Strand, parts of Australia, parts of South America, and in the case I was looking at, northern Nigeria. And here what it does, this capital export as finance capital, it shows up here as a way to tap this ecological subsidy, the accumulated tin ores. It's an exported as raw commodities. There's a, a finance payment that links the structures of colonial uh, governance between the Metropolitan Court and the periphery. So what you've got here then is my simple point, if you remember nothing else from this diagram, is that the mine is one small part of a much bigger political ecology of capital circulation. So, to conclude, I think then that political ecologies of extraction can be characterized as showing how extraction appropriates and distributes an ecological surplus, natural production in other words, how it appropriates that and distributes it. That it shows and it well, examines how that particular pattern of appropriation and distribution enables accumulation and for whom. And this is my point about decentering extraction. We should be asking why extractives, why here, why now? Why is money coming into this venture now? Where's it coming from? What logic is it expressing? And the third point is that political colleges of extraction would recognise then how resource characteristics, time, space and form is a handy holy trinity, if you like, for thinking about what the difference that nature makes. Recognise how those resource characteristics and the conditions of capital circulation shape extractive institutions. So by extractive institutions I mean things like the, the, the mine claim, the access rights, the relationships with between state and capital, the competitive structures in that industry. Okay, so I hope that's been useful. Um, I've put it together this way, thinking that the objective of our workshop is to introduce some theories of political ecology, and I've tried to do it along the lines of extraction. Um, uh, I'll stop there.